Welcome, Welcome to Footnotes to Endnotes, your left communist communization theory, value form theory, radio hour. The only uh, podcast officially endorsed <laughs> on the internet and also officially endorsed by uh, the uh, Endnotes Collective. And we can say that because they're communists and they're anonymous yeah. and they can't say shit. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, communism. Take that copyright. Um, so, we are here today to, we are gathered here today <laughs> in the house of our Lord to discuss the, the history of subsumption. It's more about Hegel than Marx, yeah, actually, if you remember. Yeah, like the special, like, Hegel guest episode. They tried to get the Hegel yeah. series off the ground with this one, but... Um, anyway, great. It's pretty. It's a pretty good essay. I yeah, thought yeah, it was yeah. a much better one than uh, the moving contradiction, like, and uh, yeah, very interesting. It actually redeemed a lot of the problems I had with the moving contradiction, which I think if you're just reading this collection like on your own as a piece of literature, it would probably flow a lot better because the moving contradiction is basically just setting up a lot of like data points, which are like yeah brought to fruition here so if you, if you just read number five and you're feeling a bit frustrated like keep going keep going it keep going it gets better and you know you have your your good buddies here to uh get you through it yeah. it's a great discussion i think our best discussion ever best, better than any discussion ever. that has ever happened in in the history of the world like, at least in socrates 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 who? <laughs> um, yeah, next week's episode is a special um, uh, peripatetic episode where special. we're going to be uh, walking and recording. Yeah. No, that's that's a joke. Oh, we're just going to be on treadmills. Like, yeah, we'll, we'll be on treadmills. Like that video about that band from like 12 years ago. Yeah, we've been reading... Um, Aristotle and uh, you know he t- he talks about how you got you got to walk around while you're yeah. while you're thinking and talking. It, yeah, nature ripped a lot of stuff off Aristotle. Yeah, he sure did. Anyway, uh, my name is uh, Uriah Marx Hodorov. Follow me on Twitter at the Inverted Form. Owen. Um, my name is Owen Gilbride, and you can find me on the internet at World Three TK. Leave a comment if you enjoyed. You can comment on YouTube, Uh, like, subscribe, share, share, Share. not C-H-E-R, but you actually are share, please, 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 yeah, please retweet. You probably have more Twitter followers than we do, hopefully. Yeah, and and more than me. I I will admit that her, uh, I think it's like 14 million is more than my... 400. Damn, 14 million? Yeah. That's like a small nation. I don't even know that she's not even, like, doing anything. When's the last time she put out a song? Anyway, (laughs) that's it. Enjoy the episode. See you next time. Bye. Right, so I think, I think, just to try to give my own summary of this essay, what they are trying to do is to um, historicize class struggle and the reason that they use the concept of subsumption is because uh, in their like history of it coming out of you know Kantian philosophy and like German idealism it, it starts with Kant and then Hegel like criticizes it and then Marx criticizes it some more and then you know some of the kind of uh, communist people mid-century communist people that end notes like criticize the concept of subsumption and develop it even further but um, like the reason that they, I think, are using this idea of subsumption is because specifically it, um, <clears throat> like when they're talking about negri, like around the middle of the essay, um, the way they present it is, is as though uh, like it is through the violence of one concept being, you know, incorporated into and like made to fit into another concept, the, the particular is forced into the under the heading of the universal um when when you're looking at that process within the context of capitalism um 
like that the conflict between those two uh, forces between those concepts of the universal and the particular it um, like charting the history of that is going to be charting the history of class struggle so the the reason that they want to use this concept of subsumption is it's specifically like presuming a kind of like ideological a priori they already have like a political it, it like the history of subsumption is particular to communist theory because they want to like look at the history of how the class relationship has de- developed but specifically understanding it in terms of class struggle um so i think does does that make sense to you Owen? yeah so i think with that um we can move into like this first little section here where they talk about it originating out of Kant just to like uh, get a, an understanding of the kind of concepts. Like, and also, I guess, I should start off by saying that like the essay begins and ends with them saying that the, the history that they're charting, which they're like, or the periodization that they are charting over the course of this essay, drawing on... TC, as well as uh, Negri and oh yeah, Kamat are like their big uh, sources for the the periodization using that is done over the course of the twentieth century using the concept of subsumption. Um, they begin and end by saying that they don't really buy into it. Like there's something kind of problematic about it. Yeah. But at the same time, because they are communists, because all of these theorists are communists, they share the same motivation of wanting to understand how um, the proletariat has like developed its forms of struggle against capitalism as capitalism is developing. Um, so I guess to get into the idea of subsumption from Kant, you have like this idea, I mean, uh, this is not a, a Kant podcast, but... Um, <laughs> The idea is that uh, you have like uh, um, you have like the phenomenal realm and the noumenal realm, and the noumenal realm is you know the the thing in itself. It's not something that you can ever um, perceive directly. It's not something that you ever have direct relationship to, but um, it is still the object of cognition for Kant, and the the reason like the the manner by which. Um, the thing out there, the thing in itself, is able to, you know, provide the content, like a constant dynamic content of experience is because it is like seized upon by the categories and the intuition, uh, the categories of that. This is actually, I, I mean, I said that this is not a Kant podcast, but I've actually studied Kant and I'm unintentionally like getting too technical about it. But basically, um <clears throat> Like there's there's like a manifold out in the out in the world, and then you have that that is like the universal kind of concept that is being subsumed under the understanding. The universal is bigger. The thing in itself is something unknown to the individual. It's not really a part of experience, but it needs to be subsumed. It needs to fit under um <clears throat> like the categories of the understanding and the intuition which provide the possibility of experience i don't know if this is clear at all but more simply you can talk about it in terms of the analytic and synthetic distinction i mean in in kant this idea of subsuming is really not like a violent process in the way that they present it it's more like a logical process where like um if, if like the analytic ideas, like uh, like one concept is contained <clears throat> within another, so um, just like a, like an oak tree is contained within the concepts of an acorn. Like again, like there's something kind of weird in the way that they're presenting Kant here and the way that they develop like Hegelian philosophy out of it. Because in when I read the Critique of Pure Reason, there was never any like idea that um, the subsumption of one concept under another is really a violence. Like there, there is like a kind of a problem within transcendental philosophy where you can't actually know the thing in itself, but you, you know, it's not really a problem because Kant like makes 
arguments about how you can still have synthetic a priori cognition, blah, blah, blah. You can still have truth. But at the same time, there is a bit of a problem because you can't actually uh, like get at the direct object of ex experience. So the truth claims that you can make within transcendental philosophy are conditional to an extent. But for Hegel, that's a problem because uh, like he, I guess he wants to be able to like make more direct truth claims about the world without having to like uh like put on the condition that you know you can't actually speak about the thing in itself so um so for him for hegel i guess in the in endnote's eyes like the the concepts of subsumption becomes problematic in kant because hegel wants to i don't know speak about truth more truly or something um Do you have any quotes from uh, this section from Hegel that you want to read? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read this entire Hegel quote here. Um, For Hegel, the process of subsumption, an abstraction performed by the understanding in Kant, is problematic precisely because it takes an abstracted universal to be the truth of the particulars which it subsumes, and thereby transforms and obscures the very thing that it is supposed to be thereby known. Hegel says, Subsumption under the species alters what is immediate. We strip away what is sensory and lift out the universal. The alteration underway here we call abstracting. It seems absurd if what we want is knowledge of external objects, to alter these external objects by our very abstractive activity upon them. The alteration consists in the fact that we separate off what is singular or external and hold the truth of the thing to lie in what is universal rather than what is singular or external. Yeah, what, what seemed very, very interesting from that Hegelian quote and like very in line with uh, the Nietzschean spirit is the way that Hegel talks about um, like if what we want is knowledge of external objects. Like his approach to doing philosophy here seems to be um, like taking prior motivations and then constructing his worldview in accordance with mm. those like ideas that he already has, which it seems very Nietzschean because like Nietzsche is all about you know uh, what is truth really, and you know it's an artificial construct. Um, but like the the Kantian idea is that like he's not he's not he didn't like make the noumena phenomena distinction. He didn't come up with the idea of the categories and the intuition because of some kind of prior motivation he was led there through like pure critical investigation that is how he like developed this whole system of transcendental philosophy it was in like pursuit of the truth whereas hegel is like anyway this is a minor point but um yeah like the the hegelian quote like it, it does a uh, the the point here is that um you know by abstracting you're losing something by subsuming. There is like some kind of like uh... so. Where does Marx go with this idea that uh, for Hegel, like it is kind of it's absurd to try to fit one concept into the other? I'm gonna read this Marx quote here on page one thirty-seven. <clears throat> the sole philosophical statement Hegel makes about the executive is that he subsumes the individual and the particular under the general, etc. Hegel contents himself with this. On the one hand, the category of subsumption of the particular, etc. This has to be actu actualized. Then he takes any one of the empirical forms of existence of the Prussian or modern state, just as it is, anything which actualizes this category among others, even though this category does not express its specific character. Applied mathematics is also subsumption, etc. Hegel does not ask, is this the rational, the adequate mode of subsumption? He only takes the one category and contempts himself with finding a corresponding existent for it. Hegel gives a political body to his logic. He does not give the logic of the body politic. Yeah, my, my interpretation is that Hegel is according to Marx, doing some kind of like Humean fallacy where he's like, 
he comes up with this like uh, idea of subsumption within the social that kind of makes sense. But then he's just taking the thing, like the the world as it is, mm-hmm. and like like saying that because of his you know arguments, it, the world as it is is true and good. Like the the um, the Prussian or the modern state. He takes them like Hegel just takes them as it is and doesn't actually try to like uh, do like a critique to examine whether or not, you know, the Prussian or the modern state as they are, are legitimate in some way. But he's just like, like applying his model to the world as he saw it, as he lived it and, you know, not actually doing like the kind of critique that Marx wants to do. Like Hegel just like. Kant, just like so many of these German idealists, were really like down with the state as they had it in many ways. And they like constructed, in a lot of cases, like arguments for why the state and why like a sovereign king or whatever is like just and good. They constructed arguments in favor of the world as it was rather than like doing what Marx did, which is, like, actually, like, taking a radical political stance Mm. and, like, building a critique, a philosophical critique from there. So I'll, I'll just read this quote here again. From the 1861 to 63 drafts of Capital onwards, subsumption for Marx is the subsumption of the particularities of the labor process under the abstract universality of the valorization process of capital. The abstract category, it seems, really does find itself a body. So that is what uh, subsumption, like the concept of subsumption evolves from, you know, Kant's idea of like, you know, his very abstract ideas about uh, like transcendental philosophy and everything and subsumption within that context into the Hegelian context. And then it eventually finds its way to, you know, being applied to capitalist class relations okay all right i'm going to read from the very start of this section the formality and the reality of subsumption and it begins by going for marx the production process of capital can only occur on the basis of the subsumption of the labor process under capital's valorization process in order to accumulate surplus value and thus to valorize itself as capital, capital must subordinate the labor process to its own ends and in doing so transform it. The German idealist roots of the concept of subsumption are apparent here in the way that Marx conceptualizes this process. The particular is subordinated to the abstract universal and thereby transformed or obscured. The distinction between formal and real subsumption identifies the implicit distinction between two moments that we have here. Capital must subordinate the labor process to its valorization process. It must formally subsume it if it is to reshape that process in its own image or to really subsume it. So they start off by suggesting that there needs to be this like sort of structural transformation of like what any sort of process represents, what its like formal goal is what it's like placement is in the world in order for it to become a capitalist process in order for it to become a specifically i think like there's an analogy that marx uses early on in capital volume one where he's talking about production and how you know production could just be the making of something like the making of watches or shoes or of houses or whatever But the capitalist production of those things, insofar as one is a capitalist producing those things, the actual things that you're producing are secondary importance. You're only producing them in order to create value, in order to obtain a surplus value. Uh, You're changing the production process so it's no longer so much uh, about creating a particular object, about creating a particular thing in the world, so much as it is about creating value about valorization so you're only creating a particular object because you think you can make a profit profit off of it um right so i think the like this distinction they make between formal 
subsumption and real subsumption. It seems like it seems a bit ambiguous to me whether or not formal subsumption is supposed to correspond to like an actual like historical configuration of capital. It seems at points like they're suggesting that it does not, but then but more that it's like a, just like a kind of logical necessity, mm-hmm. like in order for like real subsumption is when capital has like completely taken hold of the labor process and is has all of the freedom that it needs to shape it however it wants. Whereas formal subsumption, it, it comes prior to that and it is like a, it must logically have already happened if you have real subsumption, is formal subsumption is just when you know uh, capitalism has already taken hold of the labor process when uh, commodities are being exchanged and like profit is being made. You know what I mean? So like form, yeah. Does this tie back to the debates that there have been in different people's reads of capital? where some people seem to think Marx is suggesting that capital is something that develops uh, gradually over time, step by step, and other people, their read of it is that it's something that emerges all at once, like the the complete logic of capital, and it only, like, expands in the sense that it gradually takes over more and more things that previously were outside of its domain. Right. Like, when they're talking about, I think... I mean, they talk about that before, but like when they're talking about money as a concept that is already like pre-given, mm. even from the initial moment of, you know, having a capitalist relationship. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Yeah, like all of these like individual parts, like in the specific role that they play. I think that's something Marx points out is that you do have like things that kind of like resemble money pre-capitalism, like going well back into antiquity but like the specific role that money plays in the capitalist system only really makes sense if you have all of the other pieces already it's not that you would have like money in the capitalist sense without like a capitalist and a wage laborer and commodities and the circulation process and right. all of that right it's the systemic dialectic so all of these uh, moments in capital are what is it uh synchronic or something so they're all occurring like in tandem at the same moment Mm. in time or something yes rather than developing sequentially it's like yeah they're like vertically stacked as opposed to like horizontal no they're horizontal rather than vertical wait wouldn't horizontal mean like (laughs) oh because they because then you get another and like because the x-axis is time right yeah so that right yeah vertical vertical would be like they're all there and like the temporal part is only that like they spread like mushrooms. Right. Uh, the subsumption of the labor process under the valorization process of capital becomes real insofar as capital does not merely rest with the labor process as it is given, but steps beyond formal possession of that process to transform it in its own image. Through technological innovations and other alterations in the labor process, Capital is able to increase the productivity of labor, since higher productivity means that less labor is required to produce the goods which the working class consumes. Capital thereby reduces the portion of the social working day devoted to necessary labor, and concomitantly, that's a new word, uh, increases that devoted to surplus labor. Uh, And then there's probably more in that quote that's interesting, but I do think that highlights like. You know, because, like, as we've been describing it, it is kind of like an abstract idea, this, like, emergence of capital fully formed. But this does kind of highlight in, like, much more mundane and, like, easily to, like, visualize terms, like, how that process actually looks. Is like, capitalist logic encourages, as we've said in previous podcasts, like, increasing technological development and efficiency because you want to maximize your pro- profits. And as you're developing these technologies that kind of like make the labor process more and more efficient so that you can produce more commodities for less money uh, in the same amount of time with the same amount of labor, you're essentially reducing what they call necessary labor. You're reducing like 
that labor which goes to recouping the cost of investment and paying the workers so that they can survive and work to the next day and paying the capitalists so that you know the capitalists can have basic survival, uh, that's being done more and more f efficiently. So the percentage of the day that's like being used up for that gets increasingly small over time, and more and more percentage wise of the day is being used to generate this surplus value, which is then largely put back into the system to increase this process even further. It develops even more technology for mm -hmm. like every dollar of surplus value that the capitalist spends on buying like, you know, a, a penthouse apartment or something, probably far more of it on average is actually just going back into capitalism. And right. which is how you had this like wild explosion of like technology over the last few hundred years is this like, uh, this like exponentially growing process. So lest a single episode go by where we do not encourage you to go back to our episode on misery and debt, <laughs> you should go back to our episode on misery and debt and also read that essay yeah, because it, it really, it, yeah, it's on the internet uh, because it, it really like uh, describes very well, it really like what we're talking about here about this process of like technological yeah. expansion and how it uh, you know relates to capitalism and all right i guess we should we should try to go back to why is the why are these concepts why is this distinction especially between formal and real uh, subsumption important to um, the project of this essay, which is, you know, talking about like a history of class struggle, basically. They're, they're trying to like set out the theoretical terms and the terrain in which they would, at a later date, be able to write a history of class struggle and like the, the kind of antagonistic relationship between uh, capital and labor. So why is the why is this idea of formal and real subsumption important? It's it's because like especially this concept of real subsumption, which is where you know labor is like uh, more fully incorporated into the capitalist circuit, is like very important for that history, um, because that is like what is happening over time, which is like capital is developing and as it develops so too is its relationship to labor and therefore so too is you know like the the efforts on the part of the working class to uh like overthrow capitalism to like deal with capital to struggle against their oppression is also changing like in tandem and in re reaction to the way that's you know capital is changing so like the the goal of you know charting a history and like examining how capital has changed and how like labor or the working class has like developed its efforts in response to that is is very important um because you know you can see like how basically like when we get into the idea of a uh, real subsumption and how it's developed and how it is like integrated labor more fully into itself mm -hmm then like you're arriving at the present and um you but and like they ultimately it comes down to like their argument for commonization over like a programmatic uh or leninist style of revolution it's because like once real subsumption takes hold of labor like completely and you know like every aspect of the working class's reproduction as well as their production becomes integrated into capitalism then like this programmatic uh attempt at doing revolution it doesn't seem to be relevant anymore instead like you have to have this communization uh approach to doing revolution where you're like uh you know addressing everything all at once that's that's yeah. what the kind of ontological um idea that's why it's relevant here is because uh like just as capitalism in its abstract totality exists all at once from the very first moment you know you need to therefore have a theory of revolution 
that is able to respond accordingly. I honestly sound like I'm a communizationist. I can't believe I just I wonder, said all that. I wonder how <laughs> communization people feel about the accelerationist crowd, because I two ideologies I haven't really studied in depth, but like just my superficial knowledge of both, there seems to be some crossover here where they both kind of say like the old models of revolution don't really apply anymore and you need something right. that's like radical, dare I say, insane. Insane? Anarchistic? Anarchistic, explosive. Although my understanding of accelerationism is like, all right, we're just going to turn all the knobs up to 11 and hope that things explode. <laughs> yeah. Or that they build robots to do all the work. I, th I think it's supposed to be more complicated. Than there are like lefts and right tendencies. Yeah. I don't know. I don't yeah, I, don't know yeah, I listened to one accelerationist <laughs> podcast recently where like, I guess there is a right wing accelerationism which involves lots of guns and left wing accelerationism which is like the only way out is through with right. regards to capitalism is how I would sum it up right um, so I guess like uh, the, the reason that they are um, picking out all of the various theorists that they <clears throat> do well I, I mean it's important here that they note that like all of these various theorists of the history of subsumption like converge on certain dates which you know like there are uh, end notes is kind of like uh, ambivalent and critical about everything that they're presenting here about Negri's theory about uh, Jacques Camat's theory about um, who else have it been said? Uh, yeah, they're they're like more sympathetic towards TC, but basically they're critical of all of these histories, all of these periodizations of subsumption that they present in this essay, um, and yet they still refer to them and like point to the fact that they all like converge around you know a certain. Uh, like set of dates as like an indication that you know something there's a good chance that those dates indicate like a real thing that occurred mm. um, so the dates I guess are like uh, where there's like one person here like really does it oh yeah it's here okay I'll read this quote on 143 although he frequently employs the categories of subsumption historically <clears throat> Negri warns against, quote, constituting a natural history of the progressive subsumption of labor under capital and illustrating the form of value in the process of perfecting its mechanisms, end quote. Apparently attempting an autonomous Copernican turn within the periodization of subsumption, Negri thus describes specific class compositions and models of contestation corresponding to each period of capitalist history. To the first phase of large-scale industry corresponds the appropriative phase of the proletarian movement from 1848 to 1914 and the professional or craft worker. To the second phase corresponds the alternative phase of the revolutionary movement from 1917 to 1968 and a class composition based on the hegemony of the mass worker. And finally, to the current phase of capitalist development corresponds the socialized worker, and the constituent model of proletarian self-valorization. So that that is like a general outline of the kind of like uh, ideas that we're working with here, like the historical periods of, you know, the the relationship between uh, the working class and capital, capital, and um, also like I think that quote really gets at something that I said earlier, which is that. You know, what they're trying to do here is like specifically communist. They're doing this work for the benefit of a communist movement. They're doing it in order to develop, to like be able to think more clearly about revolutionary history and about the relationship to the, of the working class to capital in order to like, uh, like more concretely, more better develop an understanding yeah. of how the working class can, you know, continue that struggle today. Yeah, because presumably if, like, 
if you are indeed subsumed into the system and like you know you're born into it at this like late stage where it's been developing for hundreds of years you're like you know just day to day understanding of what you're experiencing is like going to be very skewed and I think like uh, what they mention here about the uh, the socialized worker and self valorization to me that gives the image of like the experiment the experience of modern life of the last few decades with the rise of like middle management and like these like sort of boutique small businesses and like these lifestyle coaches and the sort of blurring or this attempt to like render indistinct the difference between like the working class and the capitalists where like the suggestions made that everyone's a capitalist everyone's like part of this like self-valorization process like uh, view everything as like work view like your hobbies as work as projects as like you know like your personal brand that you're going to develop uh and, and that feels like very much like the experience of living in in capitalist society in the 21st century uh so if you're just going through that day to day your your perspective is going to be very skewed so i think it's very important to do this sort of historical analysis and try to see like the sort of abstract systematic development of this relationship over time like because the capitalists the formal logic of capitalism emerges all at once at some point in the past but the actual development of the shape it takes in the world transforms over time as it like you know it, it comes up against these stressors and it develops ways of dealing with them like like this the process in the 1950s of the rise of the American middle class of making life more comfortable up to a certain point for the working class and then like the rise of woke capital and like capital that cares about shit or at least pretends to these are all like methods that capital has developed over time in order to like more deeply entrench itself so I, I do see like the importance of like monitoring the development of those things because if you just sort of like live in your own epoch you won't necessarily see like what's happening at a systematic level if mm -hmm. you look at them historically yeah totally i think i think we should try to kind of get into uh this a little bit more because they like this this periodization that i just kind of outlined with that quote that i just read they use it to argue against the leninist model right so like in the in this um period from this is the the first no wait to the second phase corresponds the alternative phase of the revolutionary movement from 1917 to 68 and a class composition based on the hegemony of the mass worker so later at some other point in this they talk about how like in that period of you know the first half of the 20th century from like 1968 to the uh, from 17 to 68 that that is when you had like you know major communist revolutions right and the way like they and you know in other essays they've spoken about how you know based on their understanding of value form theory those revolutions didn't actually do anything to break away from capitalism they just kind of reconfigured the capitalist relationships a little bit so that is the workers who are you know both subject and object or whatever they're both they're on both ends of the hierarchy presumably like ostensibly at least but they didn't actually get a, around that hierarchy they didn't get around the concept of value so you know the ussr was not really a socialist economy um and the, the way that they want to kind of like tie that in here is by saying that like, um, you know, during that period of history, like the way that the worker related to capital, to like formal capital or to this early development of, you know, the real subsumption of uh, labor is by like a self valorization, they, which is what resulted in them just like getting a worker's state you know what i mean like the the proletariat within you know um soviet russia just made a 
state that is more advantageous to the proletariat, but they didn't uh, like actually get away from capital from the value form. Um, and like they, it, I think that's a really important point for them because like it, it, you know, it goes back to like why they want to say that programmatism, like this idea of uh, a proletariat that is, you know, um, <clears throat> directed by a vanguard party that is like a, well, just this this idea of like a proletariat that is, you know, like just advocating for itself within the terms of capitalism, within like the its subsumed reality, um, it's it's not going to be able to uh, actually overcome the value form. I know I know that I'm not uh, like articulating this very well, but it is very important for them, I think, and it's very important for me as well this point that they're making that um, like at that, at that point in history, when we associate with so many important communist revolutions, uh, like the proletariat was really just quote self valorizing. It was like just advocating for itself within the terms of its subsumption rather than, you know, trying to break free yeah. from that, which is what resulted in um, just a reconfigured capitalist yeah, society. Wasn't a break from- right. Right. And I guess I guess what, you know, follows from that c- consequentially um, is like after 68, which is when you get this socialization, the socialized worker, which is where, you know, capitalism and labor become like fully integrated. That is arguably like a response to um, the worker self advocating, you know, like. The, the results of this, like, early Russian-style Leninist uh, workers' movement were institutions that mediated between the worker and capital, like trade unions and, you know, the Soviet and all of these various kinds of structures that, you know, stood between the worker and the boss, like the forces of production and capital, and you know ameliorated the workers condition made it better arguably like in russia indubitably changed society significantly but you know like it still uh like held the same dynamic but then like when you know in response to that capital had to like uh, you know develop a strategy for dealing with that mm. So that it and, and like I'm I'm not trying to anthropomorphize uh, like a uh, logic here, but capital uh, like developed this technique of integrating the working class into itself, doing away with those kinds of institutions like labor unions and you know things that might resemble a Soviet, whatever that might be. Um, and you know, it's it's like it it is in response to the movements of the first half of the twentieth century that you get the movement of capital in the second half. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 Okay. Do you, have a, do you have a quote highlighted on the next page? Let's read it. All right. This is from uh, the Theory Communist. Not French accent. Sorry. <laughs> The theory communist (laughs) in French. Um, The extraction of relative surplus value affects all social combinations from the labor process to the political forms of workers' representation, passing through the integration of the reproduction of labor power in the cycle of capital. The role of the credit system, the constitution of a specifically capitalist world market, the subordination of science, Real subsumption is a transformation of society and not of the labor process alone. Which seems to be uh, this argument that they keep coming back to throughout, which I guess is put forward by Teeth C, is this idea that capitalism doesn't just take over the production process, it basically takes over everything. Like, um, your entire world picture, society's entire world picture becomes one that's in line with the logic of capital, where 
it sort of puts itself in as the foundational, like, telos of, like, everything else, like, of science, like, science takes on a capitalist logic, art takes on a capitalist logic, yeah. family, relationships between people, racial relations, like, the ways of structuring government, uh, the distribution of power, etc., etc., like, everything is recast in a capitalist light, which... To me, this is like the key when you when you like look at like you know the development of capitalism over the twentieth century and how at, at like a superficial glance it might seem like oh capitalism's getting better because like now the working class has bigger houses in the suburbs or at least they did for a while or like oh now capitalism's more woke or like there's more small business owners or whatever like there there's like these capitalist apologetics where like. He, you know, like, it's getting better over time, we just need to stick with it, and, like, eventually we'll have, like, more robots to do the work, and people will live more comfortably. But, like, what's really going on is it's, like, you're, you're being presented with, like, this, like, simulacra version of anything that existed previously, or anything else that could potentially exist. Like, any idea you have, any sort of, like, subversive or alternative, or anything, like, that exists fundamentally outside of the structure of capitalism is taken in by the capitalism and then you give they give you back something where like the further generation of capital is like the point of this mm -hmm. thing and I think that's why like ultimately this is like an unhealthy and untenable like system for the development of societies like no matter how much technology it gives us or like no matter how much it raises like the the material comfort of the working class at various periods, there's still this like endless process of like making capital the central object of fixation of any sort of project, which uh, I feel like I could come up with like a lo logical argument for why I'm against that, but honestly, like I first and foremost just find that repulsive on like a like a moral and aesthetic level. Yeah, I mean, I find that repulsive as well, but I think, like, it's actually, I mean, more important to give a formal argument against that, because, like, you know, we're talking to people who have different aesthetics than us, potentially, yeah. like, they cannot, like, we cannot advocate for every person in the world, like, having some complete, like, brain shift or, like, lifestyle shift, you know what I mean, like, a lot of people don't want to think about that. They don't want to think outside of their uh, current existence. So, like, that kind of appeal is not going to, um, like, resonate with them. Like, it's yeah. not going to have, like, a, as wide a, an appeal as, or as wide a potential appeal as, um, you know, a, a logical More, appeal. like... Yeah, so I do feel like a stronger argument that I'd like to develop would be one where it's like, okay, well... What are the pre what are like the actual like long term of effects of like a world in which capitalism is the central driving force? Like, if you can follow that logically long enough, what sort of like catastrophes could that like lead to in like terms of the environment or like you know social development? Yeah, I mean maybe uh, now that I'm thinking about it, maybe it is actually more effective to make an aesthetic appeal because like people are so miserable and. This That's probably true. how they can be reached. But, like, I think, I mean, what we are reading is a non-aesthetic appeal. This is, like, yeah. a logical appeal. This is a t an attempt to, like, scientifically criticize capitalism within its own terms and demonstrate exactly what you're looking for, which is, like, a foolproof argument yeah, for yeah, yeah. why capitalism is not sustainable, not on some moralistic or aesthetic uh, basis that you know a particular person could argue against like yeah. like th those those conditions are subjective but they want to make like objective arguments yeah which is like you know that seems like always a good strategy because if you if you approach the subject on an emotional level it's too easy for your opponent to like disregard it on an equally emotional right. level like they'll just see you as oh the enemy like you know if you're able to keep things logical the best for you but to like a logic within a framework that your opponent will at least be able to acknowledge the logical integrity of it then you can like maybe have some degree of traction in shifting people's thoughts right 
I find like some of the arguments like that big speech that I just made about um, uh, like how, uh, you know, proletarian self-affirmation is just, you know, it's it's limited within the or It has historically been limited to the terms of, you know, the system that it's trying to fight against. And like the way they present it here on page 146, I find it a bit offensive almost. Like it seems very disrespectful and like anti-communist just to say, for example, proletarian self-affirmation can never be beget proletarian self-negation and the negation of capital. Um, thus, in this phase, the communist revolution was impossible, or rather the communist revolution as affirmation slash liberation of labor carried within it the counter-revolution. Like, to me, that seems a bit, um, I don't know, it, I, it doesn't seem fair. Like, I think that, you know, mm. that you could point to any number of historical events in which you know like things could have gone otherwise and the USSR could have like continued its tra trajectory and the you know become more socialist and like broken away with the worker state that they built for themselves or, or where China didn't you know continued to be revolutionary and did not you know fall victim to the capitalist rotors yeah I feel like just my immediate reaction to like the way they frame this here is proletarian self-affirmation can never beget proletarian self-negation. Um, like what they're calling the proletarian self-affirmation is only like proletarian self-affirmation through the lens of like the capitalist system that we're inhabiting. If you think of like that self-affirmation as like an event in the sense that Badu uses it where like an event is kind of like the rupture in the structure of the known where like something that can only be retroactively understood emerges so that like proletarian self-affirmation is kind of like an event in the capitalist system where if it ultimately like if it fails and like you know or fails like with quotation marks and uh, capitalism reaffirms itself it will just be seen as like oh this proletarian self-affirmation that you know wasn't able to make a self-negation but if there was actually a new social order that was to emerge from that and would like, you know, overcode capitalism and bring in some new era, which we cannot currently see because it will be something new and different, um, retroactively it will not be seen as like a proletarian self-affirmation. It will be seen as like something within the logic of whatever new superstructure mm -hmm. emerges. It's like we're trying to predict something that does not yet exist. Like when we talk about the communist society like I think what we're truly pointing towards is something that's like emergent we can only like we can use like the language and the logic of the system we can currently inhabit but we understand on a fundamental level that this is something that's going to like kind of rupture the logic of it yeah so it's like you know this one event can be seen through different lenses depending upon the systematic that you inhabit yeah. very well said thank you All right, critique of the history of subsumption. This is where I guess they like bring it full circle and talk about how uh, you know the periodization that the and the theory of periodization that they've been uh, outlining is inadequate. I don't. I mean, why why do they think that? Why are they not satisfied with it? shed some light. As we have seen, subsumption has a distinct ontological character. The violence that is committed by a subsuming category lies in the fact that it is able to pass itself off as the truth of the very thing which it subsumes. To transform that particular into the mere instantiation of the universal. When the labor process is subsumed under the valorization process, it becomes capital's own immediate process of production. As Kamat argues, subsumption means rather more than just submission. Uh, German word for subsumption really means to include in something, to subordinate, to implicate. Uh, so it seems that Marx wanted to indicate that capital makes its own substance out of labor. The capital incorporates labor inside itself and makes it into capital. Mm -hmm. Which I guess is something we've been alluding to various points 
after this recording, but um, that didn't really shed light for me on why they they dislike these critiques. Yeah, why, and I mean, this, this kind of goes back to uh, it, it reminds me of that uh, Hegelian Hegel quote about making the uh, body politic or something like the the idea that. Uh, you know, capital is like incorporating this animating thing within itself in order to thereby, you know, become animate itself. Mm. But it, but like it's set up in such a way that, you know, people don't need to like think about, they don't need to like agree and like be on board with mm. doing it for somebody else. They just do it for somebody else automatically as a result of, you know, yeah. living yes yeah, like you know especially for someone born at this late stage it's like well you've got to eat food like pretty much most days you got to like sleep indoors like these things cost money oh how do you get this thing called money well you you got to go work for it you got to go work for the capitalists to get the money okay um how many times am i gonna have to do that oh you know like probably 40 plus hours a week for the rest of your life Really yeah. yeah, it's like you know, it's not really like the decision that anyone's making. It's just kind of like what you're thrown into. I'll just read this quote to try to understand why they have a problem with subsumption. If the categories of subsumption are applicable to history at all, this can therefore only be in a non-linear fashion. They cannot apply simplistically or unidirectionally to the historical development of the class relation. Whilst we would plausibly, we could plausibly say that at the total level, at any given stage in the development of this relation, the labor process is more or less really subsumed under the valorization process than at any other given moment. This can only be a weak and ambiguous claim. It can hardly form a systematic basis for any account of actual historical developments. Does that make sense to you? Honestly, I was kind of looking for the quote <laughs> as you were reading it. It's on page 150. 150. It's about halfway through the first okay. paragraph. Um, if the categories of subsumption are applicable to history at all, this can therefore only be in a non-linear fashion. They cannot apply simplistically or unidirectionally to the historical development of the class relation. Whilst we could plausibly say that at the total level, at any given stage in the development of this relation, the labor process is more or less really subsumed under the valorization process than at any other given moment, this can only be a weak and ambiguous claim. It can hardly form a systematic basis for any account of actual historical developments. Okay. Well, I guess that it's just not good enough for them. Yeah. I mean, I don't really understand why. Like, I feel like the yeah. idea of subsumption that, like, resonates with me, that seems like... Like, it's weird that, like, all of the stuff that they've quoted in this essay that they're disagreeing with, I'm yeah. like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. I want to check these people out. I want to yeah. read their work. It does make sense. Um... But, I mean, like, kudos to them for presenting this, like, yeah. if they don't agree with it, because I guess they're, like, sort of steel-manning their opponent. I don't know if it's still steel-manning when you actually end up agreeing with the opponent. I didn't know steel-manning was an uh, actual term. Oh, well, it's like, you know, when you straw-man someone and yeah. you, like, you just make them look like an idiot? Steel-manning's, like, when you disagree with someone, but you're, like, doing a really good job of presenting their argument, because, like, theoretically, then, when you, like, deconstruct it, you won't be accused of, like, having a bias. Yeah, that's, like, every time Ben Shapiro talks about Antifa. Is he stupid? <laughs> I have not listened to Ben Shapiro. Am I missing out on some, like, gold? Uh, he tweeted, like, some very compelling arguments for Antifa recently. Oh, uh, I'm sure he did. They're, they're like, ben Shapiro. yeah, they're meant to be uh, like ironical, but uh, <laughs> they're just really good. I'll have to check those in. Anyway, the I guess we can uh, finish off by saying that they do not agree necessarily with um, like the 
uh, theoretical framework of historicizing uh, the workers' movement over the course of the 20th century in the terms of subsumption, as we have tried to describe. But there is something there, especially in the works of a TC theory communist. <laughs> yeah, theory communist. <laughs> that, uh, uh, that they do like. And, uh, you know, it, it is like slightly different in some way and yeah. therefore um yeah i mean to be fair like i do feel like this is an important mindset to maintain with this stuff that it is like more of an abstract analysis of something that's like probably quite complex because it's dealing with like big social movements over the course of like over 100 years um so I can understand why, like, they're hesitant to, like, just get fully on board with any one interpretation of this stuff, where it's like, yeah, this person got it right, like... Well, I mean, at this early stage, this is the end notes two of five, and, mm-hmm. like, everything else that they've been writing has really just been, like, presenting their theoretical framework, kind of. Like, it's, it's really come across as though they're just, uh, like, setting the stage, like, establishing the yeah. terms for you know, like actual work that they're going to be doing at a later stage. So I was really expecting this to be like their, you know, historiographic model. Mm. But I guess like they don't have one at, in 2008 or something. I don't know. Yeah. Again, like at various points throughout this collection of essays, I've wondered if like if part of this process like that they're writing years they're not so much just presenting information as they're also like working on developing their own i think they definitely are i mean it's a discussion group as well so okay. Which, like, like they're just thinking out loud kind i of. mean like why they call it end notes it's like they're actually just sharing like the documentation of their own like process right which is fair i like reading that kind of work like i think if you go into this not with the mindset that like you're gonna get like solid praxis yeah like it, it you can use it to contribute to developing your own system of viewing the world and yeah. like your own groups also i mean it, it seems like they're really just like presenting like a lot of the research that they've done so if you're interested in communization or value form theory or like left communism then you know they've already done a lot of the research yeah. they've already read a lot of the shit so you can, this is kind of like a cliff notes. Yeah, there's like, there's a lot of great historical information in this collection. Yeah, and like it's scholarly uh, kind of summaries and... It points to like other material yeah. that I will, I will certainly be later seeking out some of the writers that are referenced in this book. Yeah. They seem like pretty cool cats. Like uh, Karl Marx? Yeah, and like that guy seems like he knows some <laughs> shit. <laughs> I'm gonna Mr. Go Mr. Hegel? Mr. Hegel, not not real talk though. I'm gonna I'm gonna read Hegel. I'm gonna read Kant. I'm gonna become a real philosophy bro. All right, all right, that's enough. Um, <laughs> sorry, we're at one hour seventeen. So that's been episode six of your left communist radio hour. My name is Uriah Mark Todorov. Follow me on Twitter at the Inverted Form. Owen. My name is Owen Gilbride. Check me out on the internet at world3.tk. Yes. Leave a, leave a comment, too. Somebody left a very nice, yeah, thoughtful yeah, comment. Thank you. It was thank you for listening very, that. very pleasant to read. Um, people, you know... Informative. Listen, yeah, informative and also um, affirmative. Affirmative. <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening, and I'll, I'll see you next time. Bye.